Welcome to episode 310 of the Microsoft Cloud IT Pro Podcast, recorded live on November 28th, 2022. This is a show about Microsoft 365 and Azure from the perspective of IT pros and end users, where we discuss a topic or recent news and how it relates to you. This time of year can be a little slow for news on the Microsoft Cloud, but we still manage to pull together a few items of interest. First, we talk about an apparent bug in Microsoft Edge on Mac OS when it comes to loading certain sites in Office 365 with overlays, specifically Power Apps and Outlook on the web. Then we talk about a couple of new Azure features, the Azure Quota Service API, as well as a preview feature of shareable links for Azure Bastion. We're here in the U.S. It was a bit of a Thanksgiving break, vacations, so we have not recorded in a little bit because we were eating turkey, watching the Lions lose, watching Michigan beat Ohio State. If any of you are Ohio State fans, I'm sorry, but I'm really not. (laughs) (laughs) It was a good day for me as a Michigan fan. Something, something sport ball. Gotcha. Yeah, that, exactly. So yeah, how are you doing? How was your break? I'm doing all right. I'm, I'm nice and refreshed. We were chatting a little bit before we hopped on here and started recording. So I did, I've gotten in the habit the last couple of years, my wife has convinced me to try and disconnect a little bit from work. Like I'm not somebody who does a very good job with taking vacations. They're more like staycations for me and that I stay at work no matter where I've gone. Like you can send me to Disney for a few days and I'll be on my phone the whole time answering email, things like that. Yeah. Like it's really hard to disconnect. So over the last couple of years, we've tried to find ways that, well, I, I guess I, my wife is trying to find ways to <laughs> purposefully make me disconnect from like the phones and, and all that kind of stuff. So we've been doing this thing the last three years now where we just find an Airbnb up in the mountains, you know, like a short plane ride or a car drive away. And you have no internet, maybe a little bit of satellite TV, maybe a landline phone if you're lucky. But other than that, you just disconnect and kind of hang out and go hiking and enjoy nature and spend time with family, kids, grandparents, all that kind of stuff. So that that is what I did last week, which caused us to do the Audible on, on this recording because I could not have recorded <laughs> unless I wanted to drive 20 miles down to the local McDonald's and get some free Wi-Fi. Yes, and that is not worth it when you're trying to disconnect and I would. So we were talking about this, how some people can handle the disconnect. Other people like may go nuts if they don't have internet. I'm with you. I have a hard time disconnecting, but when I do disconnect like that, I absolutely love it. Like my parents have a cottage too that similar type situation, very little internet access if you get it at all. So phones usually like sit in the window of the cottage, the one spot that you might maybe get a signal, (laughs) just in case a text or a voicemail comes through that we need to respond to. But most of the time, we're not even there anyways, so we wouldn't see it. They sit there, we go to the beach, we go on hikes, all of that. And I've enjoyed the same thing about some cruises I've taken. I refuse to pay for internet on a cruise ship. And it is very nice just to not have internet at all. Yeah, so the thing I learned is in, in this trip was kind of enlightening in some new ways, just around like media downloading and things like that. So, you, you know, you go through the the trap of, hey, kids, go download all your podcasts, go download all your music, you know, hop on Disney Plus, whatever your like app of choices, make sure you download all those things. So we did all that. And then I found out that at least in the case of things in the iTunes app store, Uh there's some new restrictions in there. Like I downloaded a bunch of things to my iPad because I have just a USB-C hub and I can, you know, plug in HDMI to that and that's all good. And we got there and I had the projector that we brought with us. And I plug that in one night to watch a movie. You know, we got like the the speaker all queued up, ready to go. And I plug it in, and the thing says, "I can't play this version of the media because you're trying to play it to a TV. You can only stream. You can only play it on your iPad. And oh, I've got an iPad Mini. It's like you have to download a new version. It's like, oh crap! I don't. I don't want to <laughs> download a new version now. So there's no setting in iOS or anything that I've found that can fix that. But if anybody knows how to make iOS woes better with getting the right version of media downloaded the first time. 
yeah, iOS or iPad OS, I, I would love to hear more about that. But that was a little snafu and a trap. But other than that, like, um, yeah, all good. And I came home, Ben, to my first self-bought Christmas present for the year, which is a new Stream Deck Plus. We're going to have to talk about these at some point. Maybe not today, but we, we can talk about other Azure and Office 365 stuff today. But at some point, we got to talk about these Stream Deck Plus things. We should, because, yes, you and I may have both purchased one probably on the same day. And we will have to circle back around to those. But I hit a snafu. Well, let's get into today's stuff. Okay, so do you want to know what my snafu is that I have hit? Your snafu. I have hit a snafu. And apparently I'm not the only one, but I haven't seen anything public about this. So starting uh, maybe a week and a half, two weeks ago, I use Edge on my Mac, and I would go to Power Apps, and as soon as I, I could like navigate around the Power Apps site, and as soon as I would open like a app in Power Apps to start editing it, my whole browser would freeze, like to the point where I had to go into Mac OS and do a force quit on the application. And I thought it was cache issues, some of that. I'm not running Canary, I'm not running Beta, I'm actually running like the released version of it. So I dealt with it for a few days, then I was like, okay, I gotta go clear out my cache, I need to go wipe everything out, I must have something hung up in there. Did all of that, and it did not seem to help at all. And then I was using Outlook in the web the other day, and went to preview an attachment to an email, and same thing happened. Everything froze up, hard lock, had to force close edge, reopen it, everything starts working again. And I could replicate this both in the released version as well as the Canary build. That maybe there's a bug that they fixed and Canary build was still doing it. So then I started searching and I found a thread in tech community uh, where it's Microsoft Edge freezes in Office 365 Outlook with overlays. And this is not I would say it's not crazy widespread yet in terms of the people that have found this and responded. It's up to like 18 replies. But it is a very similar type of scenario that apparently quite a few people are experiencing. Looks like starting in one of the 107 version range of that. But it has something to do with overlays in websites, and it looks like specifically everybody is finding this in Office 365 using Edge on Mac OS and potentially maybe limited to the M1 processors or the ARM processors. But it's just kind of an odd bug. And to me, it's a little odd that it made it all the way into the release version when it appears to so directly impact Office 365. <laughs> <laughs> Just downgrade, you'll be fine. Well, that's the answer. Someone said, go to the download page and download an old version of it and everything will start working. And it's like, yeah, that's great. But then you have to go turn off auto update and make sure you don't ever update again or install any updates. But I haven't seen any acknowledgement that this is like a known bug or known issue. Yeah, I haven't run into this one yet. Uh, but one, th- one thing maybe I'll, I'll throw out there. So you mentioned things like clearing your browser cache and all that. And yep. you, you're using Edge, which can run Chrome extensions, blah, 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 Chromium, all that stuff. There's a, I know how you always like when I kind of drop these nuggets for you. So I'll, I'll put a link in uh, Discord for you to a, a nifty little extension that lets you just click a single button and dump your entire cache in whichever profile you're in. Rather than having to go hunt through the settings and do the, like, okay, I'm going to do the settings, which one am I going to dump the last nine days, all those kinds of things. So everyone should go grab the clear session. So have you tried opening up, like going to Outlook, where you have an attachment, and opening up a preview of the attachment in Edge? (laughs) Well, I don't want to do it right now, because... I'm kind of dependent on it. Well, you don't need to do it now. I'm curious. Go do it after we record or when you're not in the middle of something because I'm curious if you actually do see the same thing. Yeah, I will give it a shot and let you know. I'll be your beta tester, sure. All right. So that is my recent issue. So I have actually had to completely switch browsers. I haven't tried Chrome (laughs) to see if this affects Chrome. I am actually using Firefox right now. I'm like, you know what? I am so tired of dealing with this because I couldn't actually... Do stuff, and I found this right before I was supposed to do a presentation that I'm now using Firefox for the time being, and I will go randomly test this or keep an eye on this thread. 
And hopefully switch back to Edge because there are features in Edge that I enjoy more, particularly around the tab groups and the vertical, no, horizontal, vertical, vertical tabs. So some of that stuff, you do some weird stuff in Firefox to get it to work. And yeah, so I want to switch back to Edge, but I need these Office 365 kill your browser bugs to be fixed. (laughs) The simple answer is just run Windows. That would work too, except that that doesn't run on an M1. Well, yeah, that's another conversation. I could get into Windows and just do Windows in a Parallels VM and all of that. But that defeats the purpose. You could. I do it every day, day in, day out. I know, I know. I do too. I also use my Windows 365 Cloud PC. That's my other Windows box. Fair enough. Yes. So that is my issue to go along with. I can't remember how I switched to that. Somehow it transitioned from a stumbling block you had to a stumbling block I had to, how about some news? Any news? It's been a, it's a little <laughs> slow. This is a slow news time of year with the holidays. I think this is like always a good time of year to just check out kind of preview stuff. And you know, if you have down cycles, kind of get in there and, and see maybe what's been new in the last few months that you haven't had a chance to get hands on with. So when I noticed that's kind of, I think, exciting if you're somebody who manages an Azure subscription or set of subscriptions is around quota management. So maybe for those who aren't familiar, Azure has quotas, and quotas are around things like number of VM cores per region per subscription. So I need the 20 extra cores for this VM series in this region for this subscription kind of thing. And the way that normally goes is you put in a support request. So you go down the whole path of opening the portal, going into the support blades, opening a new support request. What type of support request is it? Well, it's a quota request. And then what's the best method to contact you? You know, is it phone? Is it email? You may or may not hear back from somebody. And then you'll get some crazy question back from capacity management. Like, hey, what do you want to do with these 20 cores? Oh, I want to run a demo with that. I just want 20 (laughs) cores. Give me 20 cores. Like, like, make it happen. It's this kind of very, I, I think, like just fraught with frustration process around quota management today. And there's really never been a great way to automate that, but that's kind of starting to change. So there's a new API out. It's in public preview. It's the Azure Quota Service API. So what you can do is you can go and register a new resource provider. So the resource provider is Microsoft.Quota. All good. Makes sense there. And this gives you access to a bunch of different resource types within that resource provider. So things like quotas, being able to create or update the quota for a specific resource. You can also use that to get the current quota of a resource to see like how much is left. Like, hey, I want to upsize my AKS cluster or my Databricks cluster, and I need to go from 20 cores to 30 cores. Do I have enough left to do that? Oh no, let me just go fire off this automated API and make things happen. You can also see current quota consumption. So, you know, I have a hundred cores of DSV2s. How many of those are actually in use in this subscription, in this region kind of thing? So this is all like super nice because it's just API driven at the ARM level. I don't know. I didn't see anything about support for PowerShell or CLI, but you know, this stuff needs to be in Azure Resource Manager before it can be built into those tools. So that, that all kinds of makes sense. So for today, you know, you can just go ahead and fire off fire off API requests directly against this REST API, which is pretty nifty. And you'll get back a whole series of responses. So I, I was playing around with it a little bit yesterday. And you'll <laughs> there's some weirdness in there. Like you'll try and do things. Like if you try and pump in a quota request for, you know, like a thousand cores, it just comes back and it says there, there's actually an error code that says contact support. 
Okay. <laughs> and when you get that error code, all you're supposed to do is go ahead and, you know, go through the support process. If you wanted to be super nifty about this, there is a support REST API as well. So you could automate your error, like trap your error, contact support, and then go automatically open up a support request. But ultimately, support requests lead to human interactions at the end of the day. And like, I think this is something that you'd be trying to eliminate with an API. API like this. So it's it's got some other logical things in there. So uh, things like it'll tell you if it's unable to increase the quota. Again, you can always go like if you want to talk to a human and say like, all right, I, I just want to put this request in manually. It will also tell you things like if you're trying to use an invalid resource for the current region or location. So, you know, maybe you're trying to just enumerate across every region out there and all your subscriptions and say, hey, I'm trying to bump this quota globally. And there might not be, say, like that VM series or that particular SKU of, you know, ACI or whatever, whatever you're trying to increase the quota on. It might not exist in that location. So it comes back and tells you that right away. Yeah, it's a pretty nifty, nifty thing. And I'm looking at the docs. The docs were just updated earlier this month. So it looks like there is a CLI package available for it as well. If you don't want to use an SDK or just a just a, a raw API. Got it. This is nifty. So when you tried to request your thousand and it failed, did you like create a loop to then try 500 twice and then to try 254 times and to... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I was, I was just... Playing, play, playing around with this. So for anybody who, I think we've talked about this in the way back when, you know, I'm always sitting here like, oh, just go and use the REST API. It's easy, blah, blah, blah. And I think most folks think, you know, all right, I'm going to have to like fire up an app or I'm going to have to figure out how to do something like get my bearer token so I can authenticate to the ARM API, all that stuff. I recommend a quick visit to just resources.azure.com, which is the ARM API browser. Like it gives you a GUI to go ahead and browse the ARM API. But the other thing that it does, if you go to resources.azure.com forward slash raw, it just gives you a authenticated shell, like a web-based shell, where you can go ahead and fire off any API requests that you want. And because you're already authenticated, it passes your bearer token and everything from your current session over into that. So it makes it pretty easy to play around with some of these APIs, like when they come out as just, hey, it's a REST API thing to start. Yes, because I know for me too, it can get some of the URLs and building these out and figuring it all out can get confusing, but that is an excellent resource for learning some of that stuff. Yeah, I, I hope they never take like, like <laughs> resources.azure.com away. It's had a preview moniker on it for oh, a long time. Years and years and years now. But it is like one of like it's one of my go-to power tools when I just want to browse through a resource provider and the and the API for it, particularly with like deployed resources. Like I use it all the time to figure out, you know, like how should my ARM template be structured for this new thing that I want to put together? I'll just go deploy one in the portal. And then re- rather than relying on the portal export, which can be janky and not work all the time, I'll just go see what the ARM API gives me back around that resource. You know, like what are the properties or attributes that I can set on it and then drive it from there. Got it. Very nice. Do you feel overwhelmed by trying to manage your Office 365 environment? Are you facing unexpected issues that disrupt your company's productivity? Intelligent is here to help. Much like you take your car to the mechanic that has specialized knowledge on how to best keep your car running, Intelligent helps you with your Microsoft Cloud environment because that's their expertise. Intelligent keeps up with the latest updates in the Microsoft Cloud to help keep your business running smoothly and ahead of the curve. Whether you are a small organization with just a few users up to an organization of several thousand employees. They want to partner with you to implement and administer your Microsoft Cloud technology. Visit them at intelligent.com slash podcast. That's I-N-T-E-L-L-I-G-I-N-K dot com slash podcast for more information or to schedule a 30-minute call to get started with them today. Remember, Intelligent focuses on the Microsoft Cloud so you can focus on your business. That is one. I am not going to add that one to my list, Scott. I don't do a ton of stuff with quota increases. It's one of those to know about. I probably will not go play with it at all. 
just because I mean in, in your case it might be good for new customers like if you had a standard right. template for a customer that you're onboarding so say you're managing a customer of a certain size and that customer wants to deploy a new subscription well like as you're as the CSP for that customer that could be a value added service that you could have for them is hey customer X you're deploying a new subscription let's go increase all your quotas and make sure that they line up with your existing subscriptions like, you know, let's start running down that process with Microsoft early, particularly in like resource constrained pandemic, blah, blah, blah times. Like, let's yeah. figure all that out. So there could be some, I think, some kind of turnkey things there when it comes to management. The other thing, I think in your case, you've talked a lot about working with customers on like Azure automation solutions. Wouldn't it be nifty to have like an Azure automation solution that watches, you know, pick a quota constrained resource like an ACI pool, AKS, Databricks, Synapse, like pick one of these services like that. And when you start to notice that a customer is upsizing it, like, oh, you're within 10% of your quota, why don't we automatically submit a new request? And, That's and true. Put that in? You're trying to get me to add this to my list because then I thought I've also done some stuff with building some of the some labs and some hands-on labs and one of those is always you have an Azure subscription with a high enough quota to deploy this number of VMs (laughs) now you could go in and build that into the prereqs where when you go build out these VMs you automatically check the subscription quota and before getting like two of the four built and then it airing out, you actually increase it or can give back an error earlier that says you don't have sufficient quota in the subscription, click here to increase, whatever. So, okay, I'll go play with it, Scott. It's on my list again. It has been added. (laughs) (laughs) I was trying to give you a way to make more money, but you know, by hook or by crook, we'll get you there. Yeah, my problem is I need more time to make more money. If you can figure out a way to get me more time. I am getting there, though. A I, I, couple of contractors helping out have helped give me some more time and bandwidth. So we are getting to that point. So another one, Scott, I found this one. This was eh, from a week or so ago. Did you know, and I've run into this with customers before, you can now create a shareable link for Azure Bastion. And this is a new preview feature. I have not played around with this one yet. Tell me more. So this one previously, and this is the way I am with some of my clients, is in order to access their servers, they're trying to secure it, do their due diligence and not leave port 3389 open, wide open for RDP access and all of that. But then I need to be able to go through the Azure portal. So go log in to portal.azure.com, navigate through the right subscription, resource group, All of that, find the VM I'm trying to log into via Bastion, and then I log in from the portal. What this does is this allows you to go in, and there is a feature you have to enable. So there's a shareable link feature you can enable, and it is only on the standard tier. So there's basic and standard tier for Bastion, and now a little checkbox for shareable link. But now you can create a link that you can send people directly and they don't have to navigate through the portal. They don't even necessarily have to have an Azure subscription or account. This takes them directly to an Azure Bastion login page where they can just enter in username and credentials to log into that server, whether it be RDP access to the server or SSH access to the server. So they yeah, they just go straight to the login now and skip the whole navigate through the Azure portal thing and find the VM and connect that way. Gotcha. So yeah, I guess you have to manage these links a little bit. You do have to manage them. In that once you create them, you might want to delete them at a later time kind of thing. Like put some lifecycle management around them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, kind of like you would have like maybe like a OneDrive link or things like that, or you know Dropbox, any any one of those services. Yeah, if you're coming from a SharePoint background, or you do Teams files shares and SharePoint file shares, and sharing those with like anonymous links, or here's a link to an email address, and I have to type in a code, and then they kind of stick around forever, unless you put some type of policy in place or go in and manually delete them. You probably want to do the same thing with. These Bastion links is, this link is associated with a specific VM. Right now, I don't see any 
policy or any way to like auto expire these, that would be super nice. Like I'm a contractor, I need to log in, I'm doing contracting work for the next 30 days, 60 days. Let's create a shareable link to this this bastion shareable link that I can use, connect for 30 or 60 days, and it automatically expires. Right now it is a manual process where you have to go into your bastion resource. You have a menu option for shareable links and it will give you a list of VMs and the shareable links associated with them. And then you do have to go in and select it and manually delete that. And then if someone goes and tries to hit it, it's no longer going to try to connect. You'll get an error and it'll just kind of blow up for anybody that tries to use that deleted shareable link. There's also <laughs> well, some. I mean, back to that ARM <laughs> API thing, right? Like, yeah. Uh, if you wanted to automate the lifecycle things, like delete shareable links, things like that. And I'm just clicking around the portal while you're talking. These are just, they're just calls to the Bastion resource provider. So totally automatable. Yep. And they do have permissions. So if you do, for those people that want to create the links, you do need to have certain permissions around creating shareable URLs for VMs, deleting shareable URLs. There are specific access controls within the Microsoft Network Bastion host section to set up permissions. There's also a few limitations here around shareable links not being supported across peered VNets, not in the same subscription, peered VNets not in the same region, it's not supported in national clouds during preview, and then the standard SKU. So there are a few things there if you're trying to span peered VNet specifically that this does not work well, It's at least in preview, and may come down the road. But I found this nifty, again, being a contractor and sometimes needing to get access to a customer's Azure portal just to go navigate to a VM to log in. This comes in very handy in some of those situations where it's just logging into the VM. I don't want to go mess with all the permissions all through the Azure portal and tell you how to navigate to where that VM is just so you can connect to it. So the other thing I see here, I don't know if you've had to like if you had a chance to play with it with anyone yet, is these the URIs that are generated are gnarly. <laughs> and because they're going to bastion.azure.com, just like every bastion request does, those are all the bastion requests are crazy, like fronted by GUID URI kinds of things that don't have any rhyme or reason. So if I had my VM1 and my VM2 and my VM3, you're going to end up with something like GUID.bastion.azure.com for you know my VM1. You're going to have another GUID GUID for my VM2, another GUID for my VM3. There's not a whole lot of, (laughs) there's not an easy mapping there to get from URI to this goes to this resource kind of thing. Like, this seems good, but it's weird. Like, you'd still want a spreadsheet or something (laughs) that you could share with somebody that says, here's the link to this resource kind of thing. Or, hey, keep this email that I sent you with this link because it's only ever going to go to this VM as long as that VM exists. Right. Uh, I I think the other weird thing is, like, if the VM is deleted, then the link is still there. But as an end user consuming that, you could run into an error that way and have to maybe go do some manual cleanup, things like that. I get what you're saying about the GUID. Cognitive load is real. Yeah, I get what you're saying about the GUID, but from the other perspective, I also really like it because... You, it, it makes it so you can't couldn't figure out like a company's naming perspective, or it's not a very easily. I, I don't really want to say hackable because you're not hacking the URL, but you think of like the Zoom meeting bombing where it was so easy to like just type, start typing in random numbers and find somebody's Zoom meeting. This is not going to make it very easy to find somebody's shareable link. I use a password manager, so in my case, if somebody sent this to me, I'm like, I'll just grab the URL, stash it in the password manager with the credentials for the VM, or even as its own independent entity, but you are definitely going to want to have some, I would say, some secure place to store that URL, because you really wouldn't want that getting out in the wild, so someone could go hit it and then try to brute force their way into your VM via... Azure Bastion. You know where this would be really nifty? I don't know if you've done this in the past, but because you mentioned labs earlier and and kind of starting up and getting those all configured. So I've done this at a couple of organizations I've worked at where we have dev teams 
that need to have their VMs and they need to kind of have their VMs on demand, but you want them to be able to turn them on, turn them off kinds of things. We've built separate portals where you just have, hey, dev team A, B, and C, go log into this portal over here. It will show you all the VMs that you have access to. And then just a start stop button, something like that, that makes it super easy for them to either start a single VM or a whole bunch of VMs. Uh And you know, I could see this being a cool solution on there to just extend it out and include shareable links. So that I mean, that's why they wanted the VM so they could actually get onto it, RDP to it, do all their work, those kinds of things, is have start, stop, and and then connect and connect is just mapped back to that shareable link. So it starts to kind of maybe mask some of that away, like the cognitive load of right. IVM one to goo it over here. Yeah, no, for sure. Cause I've, I have absolutely had that before where it's like, which VM is which and trying to keep names straight and IPs or DNSs. And yeah, this could definitely have some uses there as well. So I, yeah, I saw this the other day and I was like, huh, that's kind of cool because I have absolutely struggled with I need access to this customer's VM before and again, the cognitive load from that perspective of knowing where it is and how to navigate to it. and <laughs> Especially yeah. because, and I'm sure you've seen this, if you like give access to the resource but not to the subscription, you can't always navigate your way down because you can't see the subscription. But if you have the access or the link to the resource group or you know how to search for it, like there's a whole cognitive yep. load associated with <laughs> best practices for permissions for navigating to Azure resources. I think I would rather have this cognitive load of remembering to save the URL or finding it than some of that gnarly Azure navigation in super secure environments. Yeah, I'm with you. I cringe every time I go into the subscription switcher inside the Azure <laughs> portal now. Uh, which one of you do? No, none of them work. <laughs> yeah. So anything else, Scott? Those two topics took up. We had a whole bunch of stuff. We were like, oh, we could talk about this and this. And then all of a sudden we're getting close to or close to or at our time already. No, that I think that does it for today cuz we're going to be back later this week. We got we got more to do. Yes, save as some we of get these, into December. Yeah, save some of these topics cuz I'm gone, you're gone, vacations are a real thing, so in order to continue to release these on a regular basis, we have a bit of a weird recording schedule to make sure we have stuff coming to you no matter what holiday it is or who's on vacation when. All right. Well, thanks. We'll be back later on Friday to talk more about some other topics we have discovered recently. Sounds good. Thanks, Ben. All right. Thanks, Scott. If you enjoyed the podcast, go leave us a five-star rating in iTunes. It helps to get the word out so more IT pros can learn about Office 365 and Azure. If you have any questions you want us to address on the show or feedback about the show, feel free to reach out via our website, Twitter, or Facebook. Thanks again for listening and have a great day.